Ratrangano and then moved to Malacca to start this project on Hawksbills. Um, but actually, um, I started with WWF earlier. Um, when I was an undergraduate, I was an intern with uh, the Therapin, Painted Therapin project in Sertiu Tranganu. Um, fell in love with the place, it's beautiful. Um, still beautiful is today, though um, much changes has been happening there. Uh, so today, um, we are talking turtles. One of the questions I've um, been asked a lot is when I say I'm working on turtles in Malacca is, are there really turtles in Malacca? I've never heard of that. Even from local Malaccans, they don't even know there are turtles in their backyard. So today, um, my talk will focus on turtles of Malacca, but with special emphasis of the turtles that's found in the coastal areas uh, near the Lingi River mouth. So, um, can you all see my slides? Yes, Karina, can you see my slides? Yeah, okay. Yes. All right, good. Okay, so um, the outline of my talk is very simple. Um, just an overview of the marine turtles uh, of Malaysia in case you um, are not aware of it. Um, and then going straight to uh, Malacca being home for the hawksbills and our lingi population and our conser conservation efforts there. So um, this picture is of a lingi beach. Um, it's called uh, Tanjung Sarai, which is a very typical beach, uh, a beach in Malacca, uh, in the northern areas of Malacca. So you can see the mangrove roots of the, um, the trees. Uh, okay, so but this is very strange because in the East Coast, uh, when we talk about nesting beaches, we are talking about usually the picture is of white sandy beaches. Huh? But in Malacca, um, the hawksbills um, are most associated with mangrove areas, muddy areas. And this is a typical nesting beach at the Lingi site where during low tide, all the roots of the mango trees are exposed. So this is during extreme low tide. Okay, so um, that's why lesser nesting during low tide. So um, as you all well know, I hope you all know, there are four species of marine turtles in the world out of the globally um, um, extend seven species. So everybody knows about the leatherback. They are the largest. If they, are, they can stand, they are taller than us. Um, and they're critically endangered. Um, and Malaysia used to have one of the largest populations in the world. Ranta Abang was um, famous for leatherback turtles in the heydays of the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s. Now there's only a handful of nestings in the past 10 years. So they've nearly um, gone extinct, local extinction in Malaysia. So if you can see that um, it's declined by more than 99.9% .9 in Malaysia. Yeah? So for the Western Pacific population, it is critically endangered. Uh, so as we all know, uh, leatherbacks love to eat jellyfish and jellyfish is mainly, uh, mainly consists of water. So they consume a lot of jellyfish and they're a world traveler. Among all the species, they travel the furthest and they can also dive the deepest. So oh, another species that we have is the hawksbill turtle, also critically endangered. Um, people say they are, the, they are the most beautiful turtle because of its golden color, gold and black color shell. And it's the one that's being traded for its shell in the heydays, but now it's banned. Uh, so in Malaysia, there are only two large uh, remaining populations that is in the Sabah Turtle Islands, in the Sabah Turtle Islands Park is protected and in Malacca. So hawksbill turtles, their favorite food is sponges. They love sponges. And uh, so th these turtles um, is where what we're going to focus on today because uh, exclusively um, in Malacca, we find this species. So the third one um, is the green turtle. It's the most common turtles in uh, Malaysia. Uh, if you go diving in the Perhentian, in Sabah, in, in Redang or in Tioman, then most probably you encounter this species. So it's slightly larger than the hawksbills. Um, and it's, it's a, a vegetarian. Okay, let's just it's vegetarian, it's herbivore. So it mainly, when it's an adult, it mainly feeds on algae, sea grasses, and all. Yeah. So, um, in terms of population numbers, it's faring better in Malaysia. So, there's thousands of uh, turtles uh, nesting in Malaysia. So, the big populations are in Trengganu, Pahang, uh, 
uh, Para Sabah Sarawak. Yeah, Sabah uh, has the largest population in in Malaysia. And the last species, but not the least, is the olive ridley turtle, the smallest of all the four species. And uh, it's oh, sorry, it's suffering the same fate as the leatherbacks. Yeah, it has declined by, uh, by more than ninety nine percent actually in Malaysia. It used to nest in Sarawak, Terengganu, Kelantan, Penang, um, mainly even Pahang. But now we only we don't hear about it much because there's only a handful. It's it's the same fate as the leatherbacks. And in the in the in the uh, decades before, when there was still a lot of them, um, because they're of their their weight, they are lighter than the rest. So sometimes they are being carried to be forced to lay eggs. Yeah. So these are all our four, four species in Malaysia. So to give you an example of the leatherbacks um, um, population, yeah. So. What happened was in the 1950s and 1990s, uh, 1950s, 60s, 70s, there used to be 10,000 nestings a year. Okay, 10,000 nestings a year. Um, and the uh, Pachit Pachit in Ranta Abang, we say they started collecting eggs um, at dawn. And until lunchtime, they'll be carrying gunny sacks of the uh, uh, leatherback eggs. And leatherback eggs are larger um, because of their size. So they are nearly as big as ping pong balls. Can you imagine the tens of thousands of eggs that they, they has been has been harvested. So why it has been declining is a few factors. Um, the main thing is because they're getting caught in, in fishing gears. Yeah. And in the heydays of Ranta Abang also, there's a lot of tourism going on there, even though parts of the beach has, was protected. Yeah. So 20 busloads of tourists were going there at night. And we have had pictures shared with us of uh, tourists taking photos of them mounting the leatherbacks while it's laying eggs. So that was what was happening then. Yeah. So it has gone down drastically and now only a handful in the past 10 years. So it is not faring well in Malaysia. So these are just uh, some general facts um, uh, about turtles. Yeah. So we have four out of seven species in Malaysia and in terms of hawksbill turtles, approximately 400 and 500 nestings are recorded annually in Malacca. It takes 15 to 20 years for them to grow to maturity. So um, yeah, once we release them this year, it's 20 years from now when I've, I'm already old, then only I'll see them coming back to nest. Um, yes, and only one out of 1,000 hatchlings will survive to adulthood. So that's why it's very important for us to save each and every egg because not all eggs will hatch and not all hatchlings will survive. So in at one nesting, um, we have around 100 nests laid each time a turtle nest. So um, why, why are we conserving turtles? Um, one of um, the key species um, WWF is conserving um, uh, for marine species, uh, marine turtles, it's called a flag flagship species for us. By us protecting the species, we're protecting their habitats as well. So, um, and it's in famous, um, we, well, it's an icon for Malaysia. So if you notice our 20 ringgit banknote, at the back of it, there are two species featured, the leatherbacks and the hawksbills. So two, both are critically endangered in Malaysia. So just to give, um, sample of how important they are in, in functioning of the ecosystem. So the green turtles are land mowers of the sea, they are herbivores. They, by them grazing on sea grasses, it allows the, the shoots to grow and also allows fish to feed. Hawksbills also uh, well feed on sponges um, and that opens up the reefs um, for other commercial fish to feed, which we love to eat um, the fishes, and it helps regulate the coral reef ecosystem. Sponges can overrun um, the reef ecosystem uh, if it's not um, uh, in check on balance. Yeah? So leatherbacks, as I said, they love jellyfish and they help keep the jellyfish population in balance. So this is just um, a snapshot of what they do, but uh, indirectly they are of vital importance to our seas and oceans. So let's go to their threats. Um, so what are their main threats in Malaysia? Of course, loss and degraded habitat. I'm giving you um, pictures that was taken in Malacca. 
um, since we are talking about Malacca today. So um, top left is a very, um, left and bottom is a very common scenario. As you know, the West Coast is um, facing erosion. Some places are facing erosion faster and Malacca is one of those states. Um, and seawalls, seawalls have been erected along the coastline uh, to protect infrastructure, you know, this is uh, at, at the top is the Skala uh, Kebangsaan Tanjung Bidara. Uh, roads, infrastructures, houses to protect them, yeah, as you can see. But um, it has a detrimental effect on turtles because turtles cannot then access their, um, their nesting area. So um, hawksbills especially loves to nest under veg vegetation. So when they come up and hit, hit a wall, um, then they'll go back to um, into the ocean and find another place to nest. So this used to be good nesting areas um, when we, we first started, but through the years, more and more of these seawalls are being erected um, throughout the coastline of uh, Malacca, either that or breakwaters. The picture on the right, um, we, um, the story is we've got a call um, that a turtle was caught um, in a fence, as you can see. Um, at the, at the dawn in, at dawn area. So this was a call at the, in the early mornings. So she probably can come, come out um, at night to nest and she couldn't make um, her way back. So this is sometimes it happens in Malacca more and more, especially on the island and also on the mainland. Um, unfortunately in Malacca, none of the nesting beaches are pristine where there's nobody staying there. It's totally dark. We don't have that scenario in Malacca all the beaches are facing some sorts of uh, development. Um, so there are disturbance to the beach already. Um, and at most, most of the areas like this area, when the, when the Orang Kampung opens the door, then that's the ocean. And we've got cases, we've got recorded cases of turtles nesting in their backyard or under their houses through the years. So we have been getting this kind of rescue calls um, every few years, yeah. So another key threat, um, as you all, I'm sure, are aware, is that um, turtle eggs are still being legally sold in Peninsula Malaysia. So Sabah and Sarawak has banned egg trade and consumption. Um, they've totally protected the, the species. Kudos to them. Unfortunately, um, there's no total ban yet in Peninsula Malaysia, except for leatherbacks in Trungano. Um, but that happened also too late because we've seen the fate of the leatherbacks. So in most states, um, in lieu of total ban, they, that is laws to provide for egg collection, for incubation via licensing or tender system. So that's how um, um, eggs are protected via, it's regulated through licensing or tender system. Yeah? So in most areas in Malaysia, except for islands where there's no open access, all eggs are translocated to hatcheries for safekeeping um, as leaving them on the beach would, um, would make them susceptible to being poached. Yeah? So except for a few safe islands in Sabah, in Trangano, um, it's just not possible to leave them on the beach. Or because of erosion, yeah? if it's that, that beach is eroded, then it has to be translocated. So the onus is on each state government to enact a ban of egg sale, not the Department of Fisheries, because in Malaysia, uh, um, the ownership of turtles is under each state. It is not under the federal government, nor is it under the Department of Fisheries. It is, it is actually under the state government purview. So why is it? Why does it matter um, that we save all eggs? Yeah, this is adapted from Dr. John Jim Mortimer's report. Um, that she written in the 60s or uh, 70s or 80s. So it is unexploited. We'll get all range of um, age of, of uh, turtles, yeah, from the hatchlings, from the eggs to the hatchlings to the adulthood. But if we have 100% of egg harvest, then we won't get hatchlings. Um, and, and as you all know, not all uh, um, turtles will survive to um, um, maturity so there'll be deaths in the younger age uh, groups and then after 20 years of 100% egg harvest lesser and lesser turtles uh, would survive and there still won't be any new turtles coming into the population after 50 years of 100% egg harvest we'll only get the remaining uh, adults who still laying eggs but after 70 years of egg harvest then we'll get extinction 
So that's that's um this is to illustrate how important it is for us to uh, save each egg and 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 not to you know not to buy or, or sell eggs. So when we've been working for 20 years, so we've gotten questions um, from people who's interested to buy or eat eggs. There's because usually one nest is 100 eggs so they, to them 100 eggs is a lot why not give us 50 eggs and um, incubate 50 eggs why can't we have half of the eggs and then you get 50 hatchlings we'll get 50 uh, we'll get 50 eggs to consume so um so the the biology is that these are reptiles um mummy turtles do not take care of their young so that's why they lay 100 eggs because the chances of survival is very low. So once um, the, egg, the uh, eggs are laid um, in a safe place, the nesting female will make it her way back to sea and never see her, or well, never take care of her, her, her eggs again or her, her hatchings again. So the hatchings are asked to be, are, are, are needs to fend for themselves uh, in the open sea. Um, so each egg, and also we found that not all eggs will survive. So some populations fare better with 80% with hatch rate, some populations do not for many reasons. Uh, Malacca is struggling with our hatching rate, yeah? so it's less than 80%. So we need to um, account for all the eggs that's uh, being laid in Malacca. So another key threat in Malaysia is bycatch, it's an essentially um, accidentally getting caught in fishing gears. The fishermen in Malaysia do not target the species. Um, so they um, in Peninsula Malaysia, they are not consumed. Um, they are not target species to make into an ornaments or, or being sold uh, as meat, not, um, not in Peninsula Malaysia in particular. Yeah. So, uh, but they get caught in gill nets, in lawn lines and trolls. Yeah. So in just to give you a glimpse um, in Trenganu, over 80 turtles were found stranded on just along the coastline in Trungano in 2016. So that's a lot of turtles. So this, this is a picture taken this year in March, 6th of March, 2020. Um, as you can see, there's the boat strike and then there's that um, strangled at the neck here. Yeah? So this is, this is a real picture in Trungano. Yeah, so these two below are the Hawksbills, um, real pictures from Malacca. So, dead, stranded dead, and we found fishing hooks on them in their eye, at their appendages, through the ears. So it is a problem in Malaysia. So another problem, uh, another issue with a uh, key threat that is associated with coastal development is artificial lights. So for the female turtles, the mummy turtles, they prefer dark and quiet beach. Uh, this is a picture in Trungano. Um, as you can see, this, there's a sky glow effect that's caused by an oil and gas industry in Trungano. So, um, and there's also street lights. So these turtles do not prefer uh, brighter, brighter beach, they prefer darker beaches. However, hatchlings are attracted to artificial lights. So naturally, in a natural beach where it's dark, they will head towards the horizon. But if there's light coming from onshore, they head towards that light. This is a real picture from Malacca um, where a hatchlings, uh, hatchlings that, that's supposed to head out to sea and by that beach is a road with street lights and it went towards the street lights and a passing car went over it. Yeah, we've been recording that um, through the years. So it's, um, it's happening um, and once hatchlings are disoriented or misoriented and hit inland, they are susceptible to being pre uh, uh, predated, but they're also susceptible to dehydration yeah? when, when they are prolonged uh, on the beach and they can't find their way back to sea. So yeah, so this is one, uh, a picture of uh, hawksbills in Pulau Ope, the Ope Island. Um, so this is what we are seeing more and more now in Malacca beaches, um, where a lot of rubbish is being washed ashore um, and brought by brought in by the currents and waves. So um, when she tried to dig um, her nest, even 
while she's digging, she's actually excavating rubbish that's embedded in the sand. Um, so uh, we are seeing this problem more and more in areas where uh, rubbish accumulate. That's, uh, so beach cleanup is a solution, but it's not a long-term solution for it. Lah. Uh, and in terms of plastics pollution, which is um, the trend now, we are talking about uh, plastics pollution. 52% of the world's turtles have eaten plastics. Um, either they mistaken it for jellyfish or algae, their food. Um, so all sea turtle species are at risk for, from plastics, but studies have found that loggerheads and greens are especially vulnerable, maybe probably due to their diet preference. Huh? Loggerheads um, also eat jellyfish, greens eat algae. Uh, and sea plus, yeah. Uh, so apart from plastics, um, there's also the pollution from ghost nets. So ghost nets are essentially nets, uh, fishing nets, that's been abandoned, that's not uh, discarded uh, and not used anymore. So they are lying, waiting to prey upon um, not only turtles but all marine animals, um, and they kill turtles too. So that's that's uh, another dominant problem that's uh, being recorded throughout the world. Yeah, um, okay, so just to show you um, the sea turtle's life cycle. So as you can see, they are essentially a marine reptile. They need to breathe air. Yeah, and most of their lives are spent in the ocean. They only return to the beach to lay eggs. So they're dependent on the beach because of their reproductive cycle to lay eggs. But uh, well, in certain countries like in Hawaii, um, green turtles have male green turtles have been known to come to bask, which is very strange, but it happens. Um, so uh, it is um, as hatchlings hatch, then when they go out towards the sea, then it's called the lost years. Yeah, five to twenty years when they are growing up, we do not know where they go. So some places have studied and they've discovered where they're spending their time. But in Malaysia, we do not know where they go uh, predominantly. And when they are dinner plate size, then they go to shallow waters to forage and all. So as you can see, at each stage of their life cycle, there are different threats that they face. Yeah. Um, and one, more, one thing that I didn't talk about is climate change impacts. Climate change impacts um, affects them at virtually every stage of their lives. So it, it, it increases uh, incubation temperature because of the beach, the beach is getting hotter. So uh, acidity of um, the, the sea is getting uh, higher, uh, it's more acidic, so that creates a problem for the coral reefs. Coral bleaching also is another problem. Um, so at all stages of their life, they are vulnerable threats, yeah? and when we talk about conserving sea turtles, we can't only talk about where they are on land because most of their time they're spent at sea. Yeah. So as you can see here, um, once they've reached adulthood, then they'll come back to where they are laid to nest. So for uh, Malaccan hawksbills, once they've laid, let's say if they nest in the Lingi beaches, so uh, 15 to 20 years from now, we can expect them to come back to the Lingi beaches to lay eggs. Yeah, so they don't go and nest in other places. They are very loyal to where, very very loyal to where they've um, they've um, they, they been released. Yeah, so it'll, after two years or after three, two to five years usually, um, we'll get female turtles returning. So very rarely do we get the same turtle coming up to. To lay eggs every year, so usually it will um, they'll take around two to three year cycle before they come back to nest in Malacca. Okay, so let's go to why we are talking about Malacca and 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 hawksbill population. So, um, the hawksbill populations, as I said, there's only two large populations left in Malaysia, in Sabah and in Malacca, and it's home to nearly fifty percent of the nesting populations in Malaysia. Yeah. So this is in comparison for in, in Peninsula Malaysia, um, where there are some turtles. So Malacca um, takes the lead, they're the champion. Trangano only has around 20 um, nestings of this species a year. So Trangano is known for its turtles, mainly green turtles. For hawksbills, very few nestings. Yeah. So Malacca with its very short coastline is very important for the hawksbills. 
and this is where they nest. So um, as they need sandy beaches for incubation, their main nesting areas is the northern half where there's, there are sandy beaches. Um, south of Malacca town are all the mangrove muddy areas. Yeah? So, and as you can see here uh, in the northern beaches near Kuala Linggi, there are three important beaches. Tanjung Serai, Meriam Pata, and Tanjung Dahan, which is very near to the river mouth um, that separates Malacca and Negeri Milan. And 30% of nestings of the state is at these beaches. So this is how important the Lingi beaches are. So nearly one third of nestings happens there. Um, in as much as um, Malacca is important for turtles, hawksbills, there are no turtle sanctuaries in Malacca. Yeah? So, Unlike in other states, even Penang has centuries uh, for turtles. Trunganu has many centuries for turtles. Uh, Sabah definitely and Sarawak. Unfortunately, Malacca, even though it's so important, has yet to designate turtle centuries. Um, so all of these beaches um, are unprotected in that sense. Yeah? And if you can see where their nestings are, where relatively there are less disturbance. Um, all the patch, this and, and the, these are remnants, they are, they are nestings in patches. Eh? Um, the green dot is where there are more than 100 nests at that location, that, which is in Padang Kemunting, and that's where the location of the hatchery is. If you've gone to the Department of Fisheries uh, Turtle Center, that's where Padang Kemunting um, um, is located, Padang Kemunting. So, in, equally important is the camp trend the the only literary camp with nestings in Malacca. So Camp Terenda and Camp Sungai Udang, which is the camp commando. Um, so also equally important, yeah, these two, these two areas. So there are actually four distinct populations, the Linggi population, Padang Kemunting, uh, Camp Terenda and Camp Sungai Udang, and Pulau Upe, which is nearest to Malacca town. So all these beaches, um, like I said, are no longer pristine. Um, all of them face pressures from development. Uh, and this is what I mean. So this is a map showing you where there are nestings, uh, key nesting beaches. And these are the ones in rectangular, yeah, um, are the proposed development in the past, ongoing or future. So if we start from the north, very near to the river mouth, there is a port being planned, a huge port with a 10-year reclamation being planned, which is very near to Tanjung Surai Nesting Beach. Um, so that is in the plan, in the works. Tanjung Dahan area offshore of it, um, there used to be, but it's um, cancelled. Um, there used to be plans for offshore thin mining, long-term offshore thin mining, but it was, um, it was axed. Uh, we hope it doesn't come back. Um, ongoing in Teluk Gong area, um, near Teluk Belanga, Teluk Gong area is a power plant, an independent power plant, besides the existing independent power plant. So that's um, so a little small reclamation going on, um, plus access for uh, cooling water system and all that. So that's one. So according to the port master plan of uh, Malacca State, they are planning a port in Camp Terenda, a military port, we guess. Um, so we do not know what's the future of that. Um, so that's one. And Pulau Ope, as we all know, Pulau Ope is, um, as you, if you can see the coastline, that's where most of the reclamation is happening until Limbungan to Malacca town area. Um, so uh, this is just a snapshot of the pressures that hospital turtles are facing. So one of the key issues for Malacca is that they are losing their nesting habitat or their nesting habitat is slowly being degraded. Yeah. So an example that we are experiencing in our lifetime is potentially the local extinction of Hawksville turtle of Upe Island. Yeah? When we first started um, work in 2006, we recorded around 100 nestings annually on the island. Um, and at that time, there was already reclamation happening, as, as you can see. So yeah, the arrow, the red arrow points to Pulau Upe. It used to be around 2 km, 2 to 3 km from the mainland. Now it's around 600 meters from the mainland because of the reclamation area. 
Uh, and this reclamation, um, this aerial photograph was taken in 2008. So it has gone further and nearer to the island. Uh, and we have seen the decline, 80% decline in that population alone. There's less than 20 nestings a year now from 100 nestings every year. So whilst we're collecting data and, and trying to showcase to the state government how important it is as we're losing one population already, and how important it is to save the other populations yeah, um, in the northern area. So this is a key example of what's happening in Malacca. And okay, so these are the Lingi beaches. Um, aerial photograph of Lingi beaches taken in 2008. Uh, when we started in 2006, we took this photo. Hardly any development happening on the coastline. Now there are many chalets uh, that's come up um, and we hope there aren't more, but um, so the, the issue with um, protection of or, or make creating turtle sanctuaries is we cannot only protect the nesting beach, but there needs to be buffer. Yeah, so um, land adjacent to the beach needs to be um, controlled in, in terms of development because even if we create turtle sanctuaries, if you don't work um, with people living beside the beach. Um, then effectively the turtle sanctuary will not function as a nesting habitat, a suitable nesting habitat, a viable one. So this is a clear example. Um, there's a chalet and this is a night view of, of um, the chalet itself from the perspective of the turtle itself. So we've worked with chalets there to reduce their likes um, and they, they've reduced their likes during nesting season as much as they can. Um, but they can't reduce all because of safety reason, of course, but they've, re they've been very helpful in reducing lights during the nesting season, yeah? So yeah, so all beaches um, are facing this. Um, these are the, uh, pictures from Padang Kemunting as well. So street light is a problem. Um, building lights is a problem. Um, infrastructure lights is also an issue. So any lights, even from anglers, um, we face issues from them. Uh, and this deters turtles from nesting. And a very clear scenario in Padang Kemunting is when there's more tourism happening at Padang Kemunting, uh, we found that more turtles are coming ashore after dawn and nesting either after dawn or early in the evening. Yeah, Because at night, they are really disturbed, no place to nest. Or they, when they come up to nest, and there's people angling or camping or you know barbecuing on the beach. They'll turn back and then they come back at after dawn. So yes, yeah, so one of the things that we have been um, we are keen to start is managing light light uh, light problems. Yeah. So light lighting management is an option. It's a solution. So that's a good news. So we can actually change. Uh, or retrofit lights to make it better. One is uh, in terms of practices that's happened, um, that has been implemented very well in many other countries, um, especially in Florida, where there's the largest loggerhead population of the US is nesting, but it's also highly developed. It's also being tried and tested um, successfully in, in, in Australia as well. So one is to manage um, and retrofit lights so that it shines where you need it to shine, but it doesn't have to light up the whole world. Uh, the other two is to use turtle friendly lights. Um, so in terms of the wavelength, sea turtles are sensitive to um, the shorter wavelengths. Yeah? So the shorter wavelengths uh, towards the blue uh, spectrum of the light. So that's what we see the bright white. So they are more um, less sensitive to the uh, longer wavelength, which is towards amber and red. So that's what has been used in Florida. And one is the project has saved money because um, the, the, it's using LED lights. So they've saved money. It doesn't compromise safety. And they've reduced the number of turtles um, disoriented, hatching especially by the tens of thousands that disoriented because of these lights along the beaches in Florida. So phase one, we want to start to retrofit problematic street lights. Phase two, uh, um, if it's successful, we want to well, implement it at all the other key nesting beaches, not only um, street lights, but building lights as well. Okay, so yes, yeah, so we know where they are nesting along the Malacca coastline, but where do they go? Um, 
because there's only one waterway in Malacca, that is the Malacca Strait. It is one of the busiest straits in the world, especially for um, goods and also oil and gas, yeah, with 80,000 to 100,000 vessels using, utilizing the strait yearly. So it's a very, very busy strait and that's their only access to Malacca. So we put on um, charter transmitters um, through the years. Uh, this nesting female was fitted after she nested, I think her third time. We named her Pupi Tanjung Dahan. She's the first turtle to be fitted in 2006. Um, and this is the result. We've, through the years, we've fitted, we've fitted 15 um, nesting turtles throughout Malacca coastline, where all the key nesting areas are. Um, and all of them, each, okay, just to explain, each of these colored line represents one turtle. So they, we put um, transmitter where they, after they finish laying eggs in Malacca. And each line represents one turtle. And all of them, as you can see, headed south um, towards um, the southern islands of Singapore and the islands of Riau in Indonesia. And if you can see here uh, where there are clusters, that's where they are, are spending their time. So this is these are their foraging areas. So from Malacca, they go back to their foraging grounds where they feed for the rest of the year and until they come back in two, three years time. And that's where they remain to feed and all that. Hopefully it's healthy there. As you can see, even though we say they are Malacca turtles, they're actually not. Um, most of their lives are spent in Indonesian or Singapore waters, depending on where they call home, foraging ground, but they balik kampung. They have to come back to Malacca when they want to lay eggs and nest. And so they make their migration journey back to Malacca to lay eggs. And then after laying eggs uh, in one season, one turtle at, on average lays around four to five times, yeah? And each time around 120 eggs for hawksbills. Um, so it takes an each interval between um, laying eggs is around 10 to 14 days. So they can spend over two months in um, roaming the waters of um, the coastline of Malacca waters and then coming up to a shore to lay eggs every two weeks. After they finish laying eggs, then they'll make their way back to their foraging area. Um, so we found that a few of them ended up in Singapore, probably shopping in Singapore. Most of them end up in the Riau Islands um, of Indonesia. So one of them went straight across to Pulau Rupat, Indonesia and stayed there, as you can see the cluster here. So uh, we're getting a lot of um, location data from here because that's where she finally ends up. And the red line is a sad story. Uh, we fitted the, the transmitter on this turtle um, in Malacca and she was making her way and um, reaching the waters of Johor and then we notice a pattern where she is drifting northwards following the current so we suspect that she's um, she's died okay she's died and, and she's just drifting along and floating and then we lost signal so this is one of 15 turtles we fitted um, that didn't make it um, well sorry I didn't explain yeah so so we've tried to name our turtles some of them are adopted um, the ones with the numbers and MY and IF, those, those are our tag numbers. So what we do uh, is we tag each, we give IC. Well, it's essentially like passport or IC to, to each of the turtles we encounter. So these are the tag numbers. We tag both front, left and right flippers. Yeah? Um, so Princess Mariam the Somariam Pata. So we've tagged a few in the dinghy area. So Putri Tanjung Dahan is one. Uh, Princess Mariam is from Mariam Pata. Um, name her in uh, honor of Mariam Pata, the name of the beach. So we know now where they're nesting, and they're not nesting in Malaysian waters. So um, as important as it is to conserve our nesting beaches, it's also equally important to make sure that these foraging areas are pristine, um, as they feed on sponges mainly. So and in coral reef areas, so for. Um, so these, these areas are also important for the development and healthy development and of the population. But having said that, we need to maintain an, uh, a safe environment um, of, at, at the nesting beaches because if they come back, if they can't nest safely, um, then this, will, this may, may end up with extinction of the population. Yeah? 
So uh, one of the things, the other things apart from nesting habitat is our egg protection work because yeah, so essentially it's important because egg poaching is an issue in Malacca. So the, to give you an example of, um, of this year, yeah. So every, during the MCO, when we are on lockdown and we can't come out of our houses, uh, unfortunately, um, the scenario is very different at the nesting beaches. Some nesting beaches, like the Lingi beaches, Tanjung Dahan, Tanjung Serai, Meriam Pata, um, we recorded very high poaching rate. Um, so even though we can't come, go down, um, but the turtle guardians employed by Department of Fisheries can. So they are patrolling the beaches um, during that period. Um, and we recorded at Tanjung Dahan around over 20% of eggs are being poached in that period during MCO. So 14% for the whole of during MCO, which is very high, but the hotspots are at the three key beaches at Lingi. So um, those three areas, very high poaching rate. And for the first time ever, um, poachers included school going teens. Um, we've never encountered teens before when we're patrolling. So this is the first year, um, which was very strange, but it makes sense. Because of the lockdown, they can't go to schools. So they are supposed to have virtual learnings at home. Unfortunately, uh, what we're finding out is these teenagers who are supposed to be in schools are coming out and, and finding eggs at night. Lah. So first time ever, it was a shock. Um, so, but um, what happened was after we um, after the lockdown was um, lifted post July, we've worked together with the Department of Fisheries Enforcement Unit and the police. And in terms of the numbers, so post July until now, um, eight percent of poaching rate of egg poaching rate in is happening in Malacca as a whole. And in Lingi beaches, uh, we've brought it down drastically so that um, with, with this kind of uh, patrolling. So boots on the ground is very important to ensure that um, more eggs are protected. So the scenario is very different for all beaches. Um, so in Lingi areas, uh, if there's nobody patrolling, then poachers come out and they take the eggs away. But if we are there, then they usually hide, yeah. So the photos are the teams in, uh, on the left is um, Naja of Trunganu. She is excavating with the ranger there. Um, this is Yana, the team leader. I think she's also viewing us via live, uh, Facebook Live. Hi Yana, shout out to you. <laughs> team leader who's leading the team in Malacca. Um, and that's um, on the right, um, Hazik with Pahitan officers um, excavating uh, therapy nest yeah in camp Teranda, the army camp so um this is essentially the history of um, what we've been doing to protect eggs in Malacca. so in 1990 the hatchery was set up by the department of fisheries um just to explain um nesting trends are based on proxy yeah? um essentially it's based on the number of nests that's protected and brought to the hatchery for incubation yeah so in that year, in 1990, uh, 306 nests were collected and brought to the hatchery for incubation. So we started work in Malacca in 2006. Um, to 2000, uh, 2006 to 2012, we started monitoring alongside um, licensed collectors at Pulau Upe first, um, because we didn't have money to do at all eight key sites. So eventually, by 2012, we are monitoring at all eight key sites um, in Malacca, and we partnered in with the Department of Fisheries in Malacca to save more eggs. Um, and when we patrol together with the licensed egg collectors, we started to tag each uh, females encountered, and we also collected data and make sure that um, eggs are eggs are recorded and sent to hatchery. Eggs poach are also recorded. Yeah. So in 2014 and 2016, um, together with Fisheries Department, we started the Turtle Garden Program. Essentially, um, what it is, is uh, licensed collectors and poachers, um, we consult with them, train them and transform them to become turtle guardians. So previously, licensed collectors, they collect eggs and the Department of Fisheries buy eggs from them. For each eggs uh, they buy, um, they bought, then it's incubated. Uh, so it wasn't a very, a very viable system because they don't tag turtles, they don't collect data. So it was just transferring eggs into the hatchery. So um, 
the Turtle Guardian program was initiated to empower local community members to be, um, to be researchers and also to be long-term uh, Turtle ambassadors. Yeah? So now um, what they do is they are the ones tagging, collecting data and transferring eggs for incubation at the hatchery. And they are paid a monthly salary to do that. So they're empowered. Um, they don't have enforcement power, yeah? but they are orang kampung from that area. And their task is to be research, uh, to collect long-term data and to save eggs. Yeah, so we started um, working at five sites, five key sites, and it's now expanded to all all uh, nesting beaches. Um, so in twenty eighteen, yeah, so from three hundred or around three hundred nests um, recorded annually, yeah, since nineteen ninety. Um, twofold increase in protection. So six hundred nests was recorded in twenty eighteen, and so. From 2006 to 2019, yes, twofold increase in nest protected. So we have doubled the number of nest protected, eggs protected. Um, we've encountered poachers. Some of them are hardcore poachers, and we've engaged them. Some of them are, has been taken into the fold to become turtle guardians. And where we are monitoring all those egg sites are where 80% of turtles are nesting. So we are going where most of the totals are yeah so we can't monitor the whole coastline of Mecca so but we are where 80 percent of nestings are yes so this is the trend um the source is from the Palma fish Mecca through the years um so as you can see in that box here is when we started and um by putting boots on the ground by empowering the local communities to become turtle guardians um, more than 80% of um, eggs have been secured for incubation through the years. So we have to, so now only we're getting the real numbers of nesting, um, nesting turtles in Malacca, yeah. Previously it was under recorded and half of it um, was gone, yeah. So right now what we, uh, we can see from the trend for the past 10 years is um, nearer to the actual numbers um, of nesting trend in Malacca is 500 to 700 nestings every year. Okay, so because let, let me try this and see whether it works. Because uh, you guys come, can come and be with us, so we thought we'll share this with you. Let me see whether it works. Sorry. Oh, sorry, guys. Okay, bear with me. So this turtle um, is the daylight nester. Like I said, it happens. Not often, but it's it, at some places it's becoming more, uh, more of a common occurrence than previously. So daytime nester and she nested by a wall. Okay, so uh, which is very rare. Um, this is at Pengkalan, Balat Beach. Um, and um, all the eggs luckily were collected by um, the turtle guardians and sent to the, and we managed to tag her. Um, but most of the time when they encounter seawalls, they do not nest. And this beach is inundated, inundated by um, seawater during high tide. No? So if we have not relocated this nest, it would have been underwater. Okay, so and, and what, what we want in terms of egg protection is this. Um, more baby turtles. Yeah, so this, this is a video, short video of Hatchlings, these are stragglers. These are not the main bunch. The main bunch has come out a few days, um, a few nights ago. So th this one at the, in the early morning, she uh, they 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 appeared after uh, during one of the excavations. Yeah, so stragglers. So this is what we want. We want to see more baby turtles. And as you can see, um, if any of you shout out to any of you who has um, seen baby turtles before, uh, for this species is brownish in color. If you've gone to uh, Trenganu. So most probably you see green turtles and green turtles um, are bigger in size, the hatchlings are bigger in size and their top shell, their carapace, top carapace is more grey, black, black, blackish colour and their plastron, the, under, um, the belly of the turtle, the hatchling is white but for hawksbills, it's brown all over. So nearly the same colour as the brown sand of, uh, of Malacca. So, okay, so this is one, one of the things I, I'm, what I'm doing today is I'm highlighting to you, um, especially our efforts at Kuala Lingi. Yeah? Um, and we started an outreach program um, at Tanjung Dahan because um, of 
poaching that's happening there, especially this year, it was intense. And poachers, some of them were teens, which was a shock to us. Until now, we can't get over that fact. So we initiated, post-MCO, we initiated um, this outreach program targeting kampong kids 6 to 15 years old. And as much as Yana and her team can, um, she's been, she and her team members have been bringing them out uh, for outdoor activities. So turtle games, um, turtle watch, uh, nature trips. Um, so these are some of the, the kids there. Very rambunctious, very bold kids. Uh, so we plan to do more of this in the future, yeah, um, and targeting uh, this population. So uh, this is only one of the population we're working with because, as we said, we're, monit we're monitoring eight nesting beaches, and each eight of uh, eight of those beaches has its own unique um, set of um, circumstances. Yeah. So okay, how? Can you help? Yes. Um, well, this is, I think, my last slide. So I, it's a no-brainer. So if you have, if you can share with us the story if you've eaten turtle eggs before, because I have not, but I have, some people have told me that it's not as smooth as, the, as uh, chicken eggs. It's grainy. It smells of the sea. Um, and I've seen people eaten turtle eggs raw. So, uh, so shout out to any of you who can share their experience via Facebook or here. So if you can, please don't buy or consume turtle eggs from now on if, if you can, or buy products or souvenirs. Um, don't need the very obvious. Um, and okay, even I struggle with this. Uh, we'd use as much as possible the use of plastics, especially single-use plastics and plastic straws, um, especially during this lockdown period where online delivery is, has gone up here. Yeah? Uh, and the last one, which is very important, um, if you have come or have participated in turtle tourism or so-called turtle ecotourism, especially in Malaysia, uh, and you've come across irresponsible turtle tourism, please do let your nearest Department of Fisheries know. So we have encountered cases where um, there are turtle tourism um, in, in the guise of, okay, adopt a hatchling or release hatchlings where they don't strictly follow SOPs. So sometimes they retain hatchlings, hatchlings are retained for the purpose of the tourism. And that's a big no-no for us. Uh, we release hatchlings as soon as they're hatched, yeah? and it's a lot of work because we are putting literally all eggs in one basket by incubating them in hatchery. So, the longer we retain them or kept them, let's say, in inappropriately in a in a in a pail of seawater or whatever, it disrupts um, their natural abilities. It disrupts their um, their their um, how they compute um, when to come back. Yeah. So if you have come across irresponsible tourism, please do report to the your nearest. Um, Department of Fisheries or MNS or WWF because more and more turtle ecotourism is happening in the world. Not all of them follow the rules and regulations. So, and yes, um, so this is in commemoration of Pak Sabtu, Pak Sabtu Zakaria. When I first started there in 2005, he was one of my mentors. Um, he was an ex military man. And he taught me how to look for eggs. Um, he, um, he always makes sure if I'm patrolling because he'll go uh, for his uh, uh, prayers first. So I'll, I'll, I'll text him and say I'm at this beach. So he'll make sure that uh, after he prays, he'll meet me just to, for safety reasons. And he passed away early June. Um, he was 78. Uh, so he is an amazing guy. All of us who have worked with him um, has nothing but nice things to say about him. Yeah, so he's a gem of a man. He's a gentleman, and he's an amazing people guardian. So this is in in memoriam of him. Thank you, guys. Um, hope you enjoyed the talk. Um, again, I'd like to thank uh, Woody and the rest of the gang at MNS and all the rest of, especially the Malacca Total team. Shout out to you if you guys are joining us live. Thank you. Over to you, Woody. I think. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Min Min. Very informative. 
So now we move on to the Q&A session. Uh, Karina will take over for 10 minutes. At the same time, I will release the quiz right now into the chat box. So uh, we have three prizes as usual. Uh, the bamboo straws that are uh, made by the local orang asli in, uh, in the Gris Simbalan. Okay, so now the go with the Q&A and at the same time I will release the, um, the quiz. Thank you, Karina, over to you. Thank you, Mr. Buti. Thank you, um, Auntie Mimin. And thank you, Dr. Hell, for answering some questions that were in the chat. I will bring up the ones that haven't been answered. So our first question is why turtles don't come why do not why do turtles don't come back anymore? Is it because there's no food? Ah, okay. Well, if you're asking um in terms of at Pulau Upe, well uh it is well yes, it's a good question. So Pulau Upe is a very unique situation when it was a management decision when we saw what's happening there um the erosion um at the beach um the reclamation that's happening just opposite of the nesting uh, island and the nesting area and all that so the decision was made to ne not release any more hatchlings at the area so when we don't release any more hatchlings essentially what we're saying is um from now onwards there won't be any more hatchlings, um, new recruits to the population coming back to nest there. So whatever's um, nesting at Pulau Ope are the remnants that has been nesting there through the years, through decades. Huh? And I have to say, you know, the first record of turtles, um, hawksbill turtles in Malacca was during the Portuguese time by Iridia, who wrote a book uh, about Malacca in the 1500s. And turtles were mentioned in that book itself. So in Malacca, the earliest recording we have was in the 1500s of turtles nesting on, along the beaches. So they've been here for centuries. Thank Back you. to you, Karina. Okay. Aston is asking, besides, Hi, Aston. Be, <laughs> besides being caught as bycatch and pressures from tourism, what are the other factors that causes the collapsed population of leatherback turtles in Trangano? Mainly bycatch. that they are far ranging, yeah? so among all the species. So the leatherbacks in Ranta Abang, um, when they put on a transmitter, it, it's been traced until the waters of Japan. So, and in the high seas and all that, there's a lot of fishing, uh, um, fishing gears, fishing activities going on. So, and leatherbacks have been recorded to be very susceptible, especially to long lines. Huh? So once they get entangled in long lines, they can't disentangle themselves and they drown. Like I said, turtles can't breathe air. They have lungs like us. So they drown essentially when they encounter that. So arson essentially it's bycatch mainly. But other factors like tourism that's happening there wasn't helping and eggs were also being collected and, and poached also at that time also. Yeah. So that also contributed. Okay. Since um, we have already experienced the lesson with leatherback turtles, why cannot we just ban egg trading in Peninsula Malaysia? Karina, if the power is in our hands, we will do it right away, isn't it? But the, unfortunately, the, um, the, the powers that be, um, uh, it's been slow, but there are progress. The Department of Fisheries is actively um, engaging with the state government um, to try and review legislations, uh, state legislations. So um, the most active now is in Trungganu. Uh, the state government has come out in the paper since uh, this year or last year to say that they are in currently reviewing the population, uh, the, sorry, the legislation with the view towards um, possibility of banning, total banning uh, egg trade and consumption. Um, and the Department of Fisheries um, is leading the way in that in Trungganu. Um, having said that though, 
Tranganu has one of the earliest um, legislation. It predates Merdeka, 1951. So high time for it to be amended in total. Yeah? So there has been amendment in through the years. In Malaysia itself, um, the legislation uh, was uh, promulgated in 1989. Hasn't um, been amended since then. So high time for it to be reviewed and improved upon, definitely, and strengthened. Yes, we, we hope that will happen soon. Aziza is asking, what will happen if we still use plastic straws? Will it still affect the total population? Yes, well, plastic straws, uh, not only plastic straws, but I, I get why you are uh, focusing on plastic straws. I, I, everybody has seen that turtle um, with the plastic straw um, story, isn't it? So that's gone viral. So it's not only turtles that's affected, main, essentially all marine animals, even seabirds are affected by plastics, isn't it? So we can, if we can, because plastic straws, we don't need it, right? We can bring our, our straws from, from home and all that. So in as much as possible, let's all reduce uh, use of plastics, especially single use plastics like straws and all that, it can. Okay. Next question. Next question is, how does WWF respond to accusi accusations of environmental imperialism? For example, arguments along the line of how all people have the right to Econo economic. economic development of their own national territory and why should people conserve these areas for the global north to come and view these conserved areas containing these species this species this is by Kiawi and Kiawi if um, we have put your question in the wrong way can you please unmute and ask it to the speaker ah. Okay, Kiawe, hi, I hear you. Very strong views. Um, so WWF, we like to call, uh, we like to name us um, WWF as work with friends. So uh, what we're saying, we're not saying no to development. So for an example, yeah, um, I'm just giving you example of Malacca because we're talking about Malacca today. So, uh, Let's say at Padang Kemunting because most of our work um, is focused on Padang Kemunting because of how important it is. That's where the hatchery is and, and we are working with the communities there. So uh, one of the things that we are, we, are, um, we are working with the state government is protecting the beach, not only for turtles, but also for livelihood. So there is this uh, initiative we've started a few years ago called Padang Kemunting Turtle Friendly Village, where we are working with the communities um, at Padang Kemunting, chalet operators there, um, even the uh, uh, local assemblymen, um, Department of Fisheries and all. So we are advocating for Padang Kemunting Beach to be protected, but no, not total protection per se. In the daytime, Tourism is allowed because it is a tourism beach. We acknowledge that, and it is important as there are chalets, many chalets fronting the beach. Um, but at night, we um, we we are advocating that the beach um, has reduced activities so that um, turtles can nest safely. Yeah, and that's because there's less usage of as tourism at night, and we. Turtle ecotourism as a product where the locals are empowered to become turtle um, guides and all that. Chalets can um, sell a new product, which is turtle ecotourism, and they can get more money um, from that because we know that the state government is always looking for new products um, as uh, ecotourism products, and turtles has not been. Um, utilize as a product as yet. I, I do not like to say turtle as a product, but um, we see the benefit of protecting the turtle population long term for the benefit of the livelihood of the orang kampung and the state. Yeah, So we, we see the potential of that. So we understand the need for economic development, but in this case, it can be a win-win. Yeah, It can be a win-win. So 
um, if there is always a way for win-win, we will always go for that. So, um, Kelly, love to hear from you more. We can have a discussion offline also one of these days. So, um, one of the things we're always looking out for is to work with people who has expertise. So, be it engineers or, you know, like because of the lighting issues, we, we're always seeking pro bono help from engineers. Um, or anybody designing work because we are not very good at designing work. So um, anybody who wants to volunteer or has very specific skills who can help us, uh, we would like to work with them. So um, similarly, please, Kelly, um, if you have any further questions, please reach out. I hope I answered your questions. Thank you. Okay. So since we, have, we know that the foraging areas are in Indonesia and Singapore, does WWF inform the relevant governments about the foraging areas? Yes, yes, we have done that with the um, uh, agencies in Singapore um, many years ago. Uh, because the, pro the project ended in 2013, um, and we've shared in Coral Triangle, and also we've shared with the Indonesian government, yes, definitely with our partners. Can you can you remove eggs immediately after they are laid? Well, if it's for the purpose of protection, yes. So um, the right um, the right way of removing eggs um, because we have to transfer them into the hatchery is immediately because there's a window where um, eggs are less susceptible to movement and rotation. So in which the embryo um, development is arrested. So in as much as possible, um, the turtle guardians, um, after they've tagged the turtles and, and um, uh, female turtles are back at sea, they remove the eggs immediately and then we plant them in the hatchery immediately as well. So the longer we wait, then the chances of the eggs not hatching goes higher. So it is very important to do that. But if it's an area where it's a sanctuary and we don't need to remove the eggs, that is the best thing that we can do, is not to disturb them, let them uh, um, hatch out and incubate and hatch out naturally. Let's work for us as well. Okay, we, now we have our last question. Yes. Okay, good. The question is, what do the eggs feel like? You mean taste like? Is that is that the question? What do they taste like? Like well, I have never oh, said it before. Feel, I think it's feel, touch, feel? touch. Oh, okay. Feel like well, okay. Imagine ping pong ball, but softer and it can be dented, and covered with wet sand. That's what it feels like. So um, the bigger the species, the bigger the ball. So like leather bags, huge. If they are standing taller, they're taller than me. Uh, so nearly the size of pimp, uh, sorry tennis size uh, tennis balls, but uh, hawksbills are much much smaller, maybe around seventy to eighty cm in length or their shell length. So they are small, smaller, slightly smaller than ping pong balls. Okay, um, if your questions haven't been answered, you can ask it. To the in, you can post it inside our the MNS WhatsApp group and the speaker will answer it there. And now I'll pass the the time back to Mr. Guti um, for to tell the quiz results. Okay. Thank you, Karina. Thank you, Karina. Very brave of you. Well done. Okay, so the winners uh, for this um, uh, quiz. Definitely cannot be Karina because she's not taking part. <laughs> okay, the winners are, okay, we have here on screen, uh, Liu, Liu Yok Mui, uh, Go Wai Mui, and um, uh, Isaac, no, Azar Isaac. Okay, congratulations to the three of you. And I think everybody else have done very well as well. There are a lot of people who, who followed, um, completed the, the questions and did very good score, but uh, you know that the, the top three will, will only get the prizes. So congratulations. Later, I'll, I'll get in contact with you, get your addresses, and then we'll we'll post the um, the straws to you. Okay. So congratulations and thank you everybody for taking part. And we'd like to uh, special thanks to uh, Min Min for uh, spending taking her time. We've talked about this talk for many many months. 
but finally it's happened. It's good timing. And also thanks, uh, Karina, for being brave to take on this uh, quiz session. All right. So the next talk is on the 19th of December. Uh, we'll be looking at the crocodile. So that will be the last of our, our talk regarding the Lingi, uh, Malacca, Ligrisian Blan coastal area. So 19th of December, uh, 2 p.m. the same time. We'll be moving, uh, we'll be testing the platform on, on the app. So I'll send you the link to, to register and test it out um, because next year we will we, we'll be taking on a new platform to make it more efficient to run this program. All right, so thank you everybody uh, for joining us. So until next time, thanks Min Min, thanks uh, Karina, take care, bye for now. <laughs>